Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for inviting the Commission to take part in this conference today. Um, I can't continue the Greek analogy perfectly well, but I am aware that sometimes the Commission is accused of speaking in a language that could as well be ancient Greek in its ability to communicate with others, uh, and I will try not to fall into that trap today. Uh, perhaps just a little bit of background as to uh, where in the Commission I come from. Uh, DG Connect, um, I'm from the Directorate G, which is Media and Content, and part of the work of that directorate currently is the revision of the Audiovisual Media Services Directive. My unit, actually, is Inclusion, Skills and Youth, and the youth uh, activity encompasses all the work we've done on over a long period of time on safer internet and the strategy of a better internet for children. So we come from a much wider perspective of how you engage with children and the issues that arise from their activities in the online world. Anyway, I've been asked to talk today about the regulatory issues and we were given some of the background questions. Uh, I hope the answers are embedded in the speech and this is maybe your challenge to follow and see how much of the answers to the questions you can track through what we're saying. I mean, it's a very, let's see, yes. So this gives you something else to look at as well. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's a very timely moment. I mean, the debate may not be reaching the public, but there are a lot of issues coming to the fore with the new commission. We have... Um, we're reflecting on policies in a number of areas according to the, the priorities of President Juncker and in the context also of the digital economy and society, which is the mandate of our Commissioner, uh, Com uh, Commissioner Oettinger. So I would like, if this works, voila. Uh, I really want to go through, through th a few things, some of them you will have heard before to remind you of what we see as being the major factors for change, so what's driving our action, particularly around protection of minors, what our regulatory response to it is, or what toolkit we have as policymakers in dealing with this, a little bit on who should or not do things, and then finish with what I've called my four R's. In UK education, it's the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic. I have four R's, which is where are the responsibilities, what is the issue around ratings, and two more I've added, which is the issue of risk and risk versus, versus resilience, because I think all these come into the debate when we're talking about children online. Voila. Too fast. Yes. I mean, you've already heard from the other speakers what have been the main drivers in this. We have the change in the technologies, the convergence, different devices which are increasingly smart, mobile, increasingly personalised, and we have the environment of content which is accessible on the go, cross borders, anywhere, anytime, any place. There are huge changes also in consumer behaviour. Um, as regards minors, uh, there's been a rapid increase in the last two or three years in the use of mobile technologies. There is a marked shift, particularly in teens, from what would have been seen as a passive consumerism to active participation. There is far, more, far less parental supervision in this age group because devices are personal. They're not sitting um, in the living room at home. So parents are not actively controlling in the way that they might have done in the past. And we have the, the other phenomenon that younger and younger children are going online. And I'd like to add here something that's very important to us, which is actually how we build the evidence and the understanding of what it is children are doing, minors are doing in the online world. We've had the debate about um, is it harmful to the brain and so on. And we're very aware that this is an area where we actually do need to keep getting the evidence right and actually not relying on sometimes popular perceptions but basing up what we do with hard facts. And this consumer behaviour information comes from the EU Kids Online Research ne Network. And we've already heard in the previous speech about the drivers that are affecting the changes in the market, the new players, the globalisation, diversification, people taking up different roles in the value chain, expanding across the value chain. 
And it was in response to that that um, these issues were raised in the original Green Paper on Convergence. And that the feedback we got from that is what has provided the baseline for our current policy reflections. I mean, the, I'm going to talk mainly about the policy reflections as it um, concerns minors, but that those reflections also take on board a great deal of thinking on principles such as country of origin, how they apply in this context, what might be the solutions, the, um, the commercialization, what you do with commercial ads. So it's the, the having sat in on a number of the internal brainstormings we've had to understand the results of the previous consultation and to formulate the current one, it is an extremely diverse and an extremely um, complex environment, actually, to think about as a regulator and to find out where we can best position ourselves. So our regulatory toolkit is actually, there are three contributing uh, issues at the moment. There's the better regulation framework, what's coming out of the digital single market strategy, and very specifically, the review of the audiovisual media services directive. A little bit of word on the better regulation framework, because this is important for us. As regulators, we have a commitment to ensure that regulation is fit for purpose. Whether we achieve that, we leave it to others to decide, but that is our goal. And fitness for purpose means that it focuses on delivery, where it is best needed, and when we consider the policy options, we will consider um, both regulatory and non-regulatory um, uh, uh, tools and look at improvements both to ex improvements in the implementation and the enforcement both of existing and new legislation and this is part of the um, the promise if you like that uh, Vice President Timmermans has made about how the Commission will conduct its business with a view to also simplifying the regulatory framework and environment so part of the better regulation framework is the concept of refit the regulatory fitness um, evaluation process to which all our proposals are now subject. And um, that is what is currently happening with the Audiovisual Media Services Directive. Part of that is the consultation that we've launched, and I trust all of you will have replied. If you're expecting me to give you anything, any information about the outcomes, sorry. <laughs> Uh, we will work further on that, but we, the process also involves additional evidence building, impact assessment, so it's quite a rich uh, set of information that, comes, that we bring to this. The digital single market strategy um, has also announced that it's going to look at the role of platforms, so taking a wider approach to um, content providers and different actors in the chain as separate from the traditional audiovisual media services players. And it has already launched a consultation on the role of platforms when it comes to liability and duty of care. But at the moment, this is focusing purely on illegal content and not on content that might harm children. Uh, I must say, perhaps off the record, we are trying to ensure that if there are issues of harmful content, they are also taken up in this debate and that we don't really rely on a discussion about copyright as illegal content. We want to look at other... Personally, we would like to see that we have the boundaries uh, clearly established. And the digital single market strategy will also look at issues such as geo-blocking, uh, portability of content, as well as looking again at copyright. So there's quite a big framework exercise going on that will have impact on other areas. And there is, of course, the Audiovisual Media Services uh, Directive Review. The, right. the refit exercise is aimed to look at the effectiveness, the efficiency, the relevance, coherence, and EU added value of the existing regulation and of any proposed regulation. And the, we have set these a uh, number of goals. Level playing field, I hesitate to put it in the singular now, but at least a level playing field, however you define those levels, to find out what would be the optimal level of consumer protection. The concept also of user protection 
and this is particularly with reference to activities such as hate speech, discrimination, and when it comes to, to minors, potentially also cyberbullying. <coughs> How to promote EU con European content, to continue to strengthen the single market, and to strengthen media, media freedom and pluralism, and also to improve the accessibility to content for those with um, disabilities. That's already part of the current directive. For minors, we've asked a number of specific questions, and really they focus on the issue of what is a valid distinction between broadcast, the role of the broadcaster and broadcast content, and on demand, and what is its effectiveness uh, in the current regulatory framework. What are the costs and benefits of implementing the regulations, and what problems people see? And this, I think, is at the crux of uh, also when we saw the responses to the Green Paper and Convergence, this was one area where there was surprisingly uniform responses that there were issues here that seemed bizarre in the current environment. Okay, so what do we do when at European level when we are trying to regulate? And I mean, this is at the heart. How do we keep the balance between what we can effectively regulate at European level? Um, where, uh, what are the member states' competences and where it is best carried out at member state level, which is the subsidiarity principle? And also looking at the role of other stakeholders in self-regulation. We've already heard that the Audiovisual Media Service Directive does rely on a principle of graduated regulation. We see that also as graduation not uh, necessarily between broadcast offline and online, but graduation defined as to where there is less control, then there is greater need for restriction. So where the user has less control over the content, then the restrictions enforced were, more, were, were stricter. And this was effectively, I think, how things worked out in the current directive. So that when it comes to minors, um, broadcasting services, programs that might seriously impair um, were prohibited, but those that could be harmful were limited to periods where minors would not normally see them. But on-demand programmes that might seriously impair were not made illegal, subject to the provision of, um, of tools or measures to ensure that children wouldn't have access to them. The subsidiarity principle means that member states have <coughs> considerable discretionary powers when it comes to defining the different concepts that exist in the regulation. So the principles of what are minors, what is pornography, what constitutes gratuitous violence, what is seriously impairment, um, is defined at member states level. We don't provide those, we don't currently provide those definitions in the directive. So one of the emerging uh, debates might be around, uh, should there be further harmonization and perhaps more rigidity in defining those concepts at European level so there is a current understanding. But then if you do that, can you do it while still respecting the debates on national sensitivities uh, and cultural values, which are very varied across Europe? So overall, I mean, this will always be a rather difficult balancing act for us. It's difficult to maintain this in such a rapidly changing environment. And that's why when it comes to a lot of the issues around um, the protection of minor, minors and making the internet a better place for children, we have promoted the use of self-regulation because it offers a more flexible and more differentiated response to the issues around, around, around minors. The example um, that we've given, that we've worked with on that, I think I've talked about at a previous classifiers conference, is the work with industry, the CEO coalition to make the internet a better place for children, and the RTL group was one of the active members of that. And we're looking at what, uh, going forward, would be a continued role for the Commission in self-regulation, given that there are also industry uh, groupings as well. But we think that the experience of this exercise was positive, and that bringing industry together around a collaborative platform where all stakeholders in a value chain that doesn't actually remain fixed debate the issues and come together to agree solutions has been very positive. So my four R's 
the issues around who's responsible, um, who does the ratings, and the two I've added, the issue of risks and resilience. How ratings are applied is a member state's uh, strict, is mainly a member state's responsibility. But what we see happening across Europe and what's been reflected, I think, from some of the comments from the floor and the other speakers, is that there is a move towards seeing age rating not as an on-off switch, but as something that provides information to parents so that they become increasingly empowered to make decisions about what is useful content and suitable content for their children to see. Um, so public authorities and industry can support this process and sh should and do have an active role in it because a classification system can't provide the absolute guarantee of safety. So uh, I mentioned earlier one of the fundamental principles in our Better Internet for Kids strategy has been to build on evidence and the research evidence shows that not all risks necessarily constitute harm. And so providing children with the tools to confront the risks supports the development of resilience in those children. So at the same time as ensuring that the environment is protected proportionally and reasonably, the young people need to be supported to develop the critical thinking that they need to understand the content they're viewing. And this also comes into the debate not only on digital literacy but on media literacy. Uh, so education and having the right set of skills for the digital environment is an important counterpart to, uh, to protection. On the ratings, um, audiovisual serv media services are accessible from all member states. And from an industry point of view, it's important that we can make reliable tr translations or transitions from national ratings and content across boundaries, across borders, so that the users actually can be properly informed according to the, let's say, the, the, the mental framework and understanding they have of what constitutes um, uh, a particular rating. It could be that greater standardization in the use of labels could provide parents with more guidance, and this is one of the issues that we would expect to see coming out of the questionnaire or the consultation currently ongoing. I mentioned earlier the, that we did work with the self hybrid self-regulatory framework, the CEO coalition, and that the consultations and the collaborative working between the stakeholders there have given rise to two interesting approaches to how you improve the way in which people content is rated and the way it moves across borders. You will hear tomorrow about the You Rate It um, experiment. It's um, based on the classification of user-generated content on video co platforms. And although it's a relatively small-scale experiment, I'm hoping, expecting, looking at one of the participants, expecting, that it should provide us with good evidence on First, on the user willingness to provide the classification and to go through the process. On the reliability of the data the user provides as verified either or both by the platform and by other users. And that it could be the basis of moving from, uh, as I said, the current small scale experiment to a much larger scale process. And we've already seen a move towards a large scale process when it comes to Google's initiative on, on rating of apps. So I think there's quite a lot of potential uh, for user input to, to the ratings process. A second initiative, which you will also hear about, which is directly funded by our innovation programmes and monitored by my unit, is the Project Miracle, which is looking at the interoperability between different classification schemes with a view to making them understandable by the user in the context that the user brings to understanding ratings. Okay, so, right, these are actually my conclusions, they're not the regulator's conclusions, the things that we've seen happening. Um, despite what you say that 
its um, content isn't, or protection of minors or access to content isn't a matter of public debate. I think there are some trends that show that there is a rising public concern, maybe not about the, the content in its traditional sense, but content as it's represented by user behaviour is becoming a concern. I just need to look at the number of parliamentary questions I get. And I assume that parliamentarians are not inventing the questions, that these are actually a reflection of their constituents. And this is increasing. Um, there are certain countries which are much stronger on this than others, I must say. But um, we see um, in some member states um, uh, a new emphasis on age-gating adult content and also on looking at age checking in order to provide safe environments for younger users so that you actually um, protect them or make sure that that space is inhabited by peers or parents, but not by potential predators. We've promoted, and it's continuing to come to the fore, the issue of positive content. You can debate what constitutes positive content for, for minors, sometimes positive content content which is not very positive uh, can appear as positive to a young person, which is, brings us back to the issue. They need to understand the nature of what they're viewing and what's being presented to them and to make a difference between content that might be appealing but fundamentally propaganda and, and so bring some critical faculties to this. But this is something that we put into our strategy and that we're continuing to promote is to that uh, greater availability of positive content online, particularly for younger children, because 11-year-olds and under uh, in our research said that this is what they couldn't find enough of. So um, to come back, that the debate on how you protect and how you exploit the opportunities that we see for children online, the opportunities to be creative, to be active participants, to be good citizens in the digital world, is something that we will need that needs to be properly balanced, and um, that is where the skill of the regulator and the other stakeholders, I think, will come to bear. And thank you very much. <laughs>